from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm Kay Jamison. I'm from the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins, and I'm delighted to be here this evening to chair a symposium, the Symposium on Depression and Creativity, which is jointly sponsored by the Library of Congress and the Dana Foundation. This evening marks the bicentennial of the birth of the German composer Felix Mendelssohn, who died after a depression a very severe depression following the death of his sister. Um, Dr. Weibrow is going to be talking a little bit about Mendelssohn in his talk. There are rare Mendelssohn-related items from the archives of the Library of Congress, which will be on display during the commemorative series of programs presented by the Library of Congress, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Gallery of Art, and the Smithsonian Institution. This evening, my colleagues and I will be discussing the relationship between depressive illnesses, particularly bipolar disorder, partly because bipolar disorder <clears throat> has by far the most connection to creativity, and also all three of us are actually specialize in the treatment and study of bipolar disorder. We're going to be talking about the link between the depressive illnesses in general and creativity. I will be presenting an overview and a history of the relationship as well as, as a summary of the findings from the studies that have been conducted to date. And then I want to <clears throat> briefly discuss some of the reasons why there might be a connection between mood disorders and creativity. Why, why is it that you could have such devastating illnesses be in any way connected to something as marvelous as human imagination? And then talk a little bit about some of the implications of this connection. Dr. Terence Ketter, who's professor of psychiatry at Stanford University and chief of the Stanford University Bipolar Disorders Clinic, will then discuss clinical and neuroimaging studies of creativity. And this will be followed by Dr. Peter Weibrow, who is director of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA, as well as chairman of psychiatry at UCLA. Professor Weibrow will talk about the creative cycle, biological and psychological elements of creativity. A possible link between madness and extreme moods and genius is one of the oldest and most persistent of cultural notions. It is also one of the most controversial. This evening, we would like to discuss several aspects of this link between mood disorders and artistic creativity. We're going to be talking about studies of dead people uh, who were highly creative and also had problems with their moods and we're going to be talking about living, studies of living artists and writers and talking about some of the, what we know about the biological and psychological and cognitive links between extreme mood states, cognitive states, and creativity. Clearly, most artists and writers do not have any kind of mental illness. The argument is not that. The argument is that artists and writers, and especially poets, suffer disproportionately from depressive illnesses. The clinical and ethical implications of this association are important but poorly understood. Many treatment strategies pay insufficient attention to the occasional fleeting benefits that bipolar illness in particular can bestow upon some individuals. It is important to know what the side effects of drugs are that might be treated and the and the dangers of not treating these illnesses. We know, for example, the left untreated bipolar illness usually worsens over time. And clearly, no one is creative when severely depressed, psychotic, in four-point restraints, or dead. In addition, patients with mood disorders frequently use other mood-altering drugs, such as alcohol or cocaine, which cause serious medical and psychiatric complications. The real task, as any clinician will understand, of imaginative, compassionate, and effective treatment is to give to all patients more meaningful choices than they are now afforded. 
And I think that the research is going in the direction of allowing this, scientists, uh, and I think you'll hear this from both Dr. Weibrow and from Dr. Ketter, are getting a real understanding into what's going on in the brain when people are creating as well as when they are depressed and when they are manic. So I would like to start now with just an, an overview, as I said, about what we know about the relationship. Um, I want to start with a caveat. This is uh, Robert Lowell, arguably one of the great poets, American poets of the 20th century, who had suffered from at least 20 major breakdowns in his life, had bipolar illness, and he described one of his manic episodes as a magical orange grove in a nightmare. What we're going to be talking about this evening focuses a little bit on the magical orange grove side of things but it's very important to keep in mind the devastating aspects of these illnesses, particularly suicide. One million people a year die by their own hands across the world. Most of those are related to mood disorders. So it's important not to in any way romanticize bad illnesses, but also understand that there are some aspects of these illnesses that are particularly interesting. Um, when there, you can really look at the relationship between mood disorders and creativity and depressive illnesses by looking at uh, people, biographical studies of people who have died, and as I say, studies of living people. I'm gonna be focusing in the uh, first part of my talk on people, uh, biographical studies of people who have died, and basically, there are a lot of things that we know about mood disorders. We know about the family history, we know that they're genetic illnesses, that they run in families, we know that there's a natural course, there's a progression to the illness, um, we know a lot of things, and so we want to bring that to whatever it is when we're looking at someone's life, whether we're looking at Felix Mendelssohn or Robert Schumann or Virginia Woolf. Um, I'm not going to get into dis discussion of the diagnosis of mood disorders. Partly it's one of those, I have to say, probably intrinsically not wildly interesting topics in its own right, but it's also complicated. It's just to say that, we, again, we know a lot about the diagnosis and treatment of these illnesses, and that when you study anyone, whether they're in your office or whether you're looking at their papers and medical records, you, you look at certain aspects of symptoms, how the symptoms present, how they present together, because it's never just one symptom alone. It's a patterning of symptoms. It's a severity of symptoms, and it's a patterning of symptoms over a period of time. Um, so I want to start by talking a little bit about the course of the illness. One of the things that you can look at, if you're looking at the life, for example, of Robert Schumann or Vincent van Gogh, you can look at how does the illness manifest itself over time. If the person had problems with moods, when did it first occur? We know, for example, the average age of onset for bipolar illness is about 18. Um, and so if somebody started first getting ill, like Van Gogh did in his late teens, that's just one piece of evidence. It's, a, it's like a very complicated crossword puzzle, but you're putting together pieces of evidence. Uh, we know that it's an episodic illness. It comes and goes. That people, by and large, at least in the early stages of their illness, tend to go back to normal functioning between episodes. We know a lot about the duration of episodes. We're not talking about somebody who's just sort of moody, broody, who's depressed for a few days. We're talking about the average length of an untreated episode of bipolar depression is nine to 12 months. Of untreated mania is about one to three months. So we're not talking about short periods of time. We're talking about people who have very severe illnesses for prolonged periods of time. Although both Dr. Weibrow and I think Dr. Ketter in particular will be talking about the far less severe forms. I'm going to be focusing on people who are more seriously ill. Dr. Ketter is going to be focusing on the temperaments that are associated with these disorders. And we also know, again, as I said earlier, that these illnesses tend to progress over time, um, get worse if they're not treated, and depression is a not uncommon outcome. That's a suicide, I mean. We know that Again, that the average age of onset is early on. Um, this, these are most of the psychiatric illnesses are illnesses of youth, and you can see here that most people who get bipolar illness will get it um, before the age of 25. 
if you look at uh, t looking at a, another German composer who was actually a colleague and friend of Felix Mendelssohn, Robert Schumann, one of the things that you can look at is the patterning of productivity over time. So if you see someone who has very episodic productivity and it's seasonal and it's accompanied by other symptoms that are associated with hypomania or depression, then that gives you some sense that that person may be more likely to have a mood disorder and the productivity follows. So uh, Slater and Meyer in England quite some time ago now plotted out the number of uh, works by Robert Schumann as a function of the years uh, that he was hypomanic and depressed. And you can see that in those years in which he was very depressed, he produced very little. And in those years in which he was hypomanic or mildly manic, he was in indeed very, uh, very productive. And in, in, in the last two years, and two and a half years of his life, he was in an in insane asylum um, and produced n next to nothing. Um, it, Vincent van Gogh, you can see again that the, if you're looking at the progression of an illness, that he started first getting melancholic when he was um, in his teens, but then as time went on, you can see the increasing number of episodes, the worsening of his illness, and then by the last few years of his life, uh, increased number of psychotic episodes, and then of course killed himself um, at the end. Edgar Allan Poe, who perhaps one could say was never a wildly happy man. Um, <laughs> but you can see this is reading it in different, the years in a uh, different direction here, but you can see again the same pattern that uh, early on in his life he, he certainly had periods of melancholia, but as he got older these progressed and then in the year before he died he attempted suicide. Um, and in fact that photograph uh, before was taken not long after he, <clears throat> after he attempted to kill himself. Uh, one of the things that's most important uh, piece of evidence is, in, particularly in bipolar illness, is bipolar illness is a very genetic, very heritable illness. And so if you look at the family histories of the individual artists and writers and musicians, you can um, see whether or not these illnesses tend to go down the family tree. Uh, this is Lord Tennyson. And this is the first of two slides and you can track his family history back um, to the late middle of uh, 1600s and you can see that at one point the Clayton family and the Tennyson family intermarried and there was uh, insanity and severe depression on both sides of the family and violence. And you can see this as time goes by, a, a tendency, Tennyson's grandfather there, George, and, uh, had full-blown um, disorder, uh, bipolar disorder, and both of his aunts and uncle were affected. And then what you see is this really quite astonishing um, group of brothers and sisters. His father, Tennyson's father, had um, psychotic episodes and died quite ill. But you can see also almost all of the Tennyson children were affected one way or another by mood disorders. And again, these aren't mild forms of illnesses. Tennyson was treated, went to doctors at different times in his life for depression. He had a brother who was in an insane asylum for mania for, for decades. Um, all three of the eldest of the brothers um, had significant problems with their moods and they all also walked off with all the major writing awards when they were at Cambridge. This is uh, George Gordon Lord Byron. Um, this was his wife. They had one of the most miserable marriages on record. Um, and Byron was kind enough to document it with great wit. But Lady Byron, who seems to have had no sense of humor whatsoever, said, the day after my marriage, he said, you were determined not to marry a man in whose family there was insanity. You have done very well indeed, or some ironical expression to that effect, followed by the information that his maternal grandfather had committed suicide and a cousin had been mad and set fire to a house. Well, actually, she, was, she and he were very much understating it. And in fact, you couldn't trace uh, the bipolar illness uh, back to a very particular point in the uh, Byron family tree. The uh, fourth Lord Byron married into the Barclay family, which had uh, constitutional insanity in it. Uh, his father 
um, had a breakdown and was reputed to have slit his throat. Uh, his grandfather uh, reputed to have a breakdown as well, and his mother, long line of suicide and violence. Um, Byron himself suffered from very severe um, mood disorder, and his daughter, who was quite a famous mathematician, um, had delusions, uh, both manic and depressive delusions. Um, Byron, as I say, if you have to read a set of letters in the English language, uh, recommend Byron's. He said, I should many a good day have blown my brains out, but for the recollection that it would have given pleasure to my mother-in-law. <laughs> and even then, if I could have been certain to haunt her. Um, Ernest Hemingway, of course, himself committed suicide. His father was a physician who also had bipolar illness, um, committed suicide. Uh, his brother and sister committed suicide, and his uh, granddaughter uh, committed suicide. His uh, sons, one of them was treated with ECT, with electroshock therapy, and uh, another one had severe psychiatric problems. Uh, Virginia Woolf, again, just go through this briefly, just say that a very extensive family history of mania, depression, uh, cyclothymia, she herself, of course, died of suicide. And this is Van Gogh's family tree. Um, and his brother, Theo, um, died psychotic. His uh, younger brother uh, is suspected of having killed himself. Wilhelmina, his sister, was in an asylum for decades. Um, and he himself, of course, killed himself. This is just a very uh, quick summary of the studies that have been done, some of the studies that have been done looking at bipolar one, which is the severe form of bipolar illness, and bipolar two, which is the uh, form with milder manias, and depressive illnesses in blue there, and looking at the population rate, which you would expect uh, in, uh, and seeing the comparison with um, the, all the studies of artists and writers, and, and all the studies essentially show a very much elevated rate, particularly of bipolar illness, but of depressive illness in general. Uh, likewise, the studies that have looked at suicide rates in artists and writers find a very much elevated rate of suicides. Uh, so why should it be so? Why, why would this illness, why would these, this constellation of illnesses really be correlated, and, and as I say, Dr. Weibrow and, and Dr. Ketter are going to be discussing this in much more detail, but you can imagine there'd be certain changes in mood and certain changes in uh, thinking that occur when people are manic and when people are depressed. They also sense the world in a very different way. They have hyperacusis very often when people are mildly manic. They feel and experience the world very differently. Um, they have very different patterns of energy and sleep, um, high energy during mania. Um, and then there might be long-term correlations with personality and temperament uh, that a particular kind of person may be more likely to have bipolar illness, and that particular kind of temperament might be more linked to the creative process. Um, this is a very, very, very old slide, and I just use it as um, really metaphorical, not because of its accuracy per se, but just, just to say that the brain is a very complicated sort of thing that is acting very differently in mania and depression, and again, Dr. Ketter's going to be going into this. This is a, a study that was done in the very early stages, in the very early studies of um, imaging, and it shows a woman's brain who was a rapid cycler, who had 24 hours of mild manias, and then 24 hours of depression, and you can see the brain uh, when she was hypomanic in that center row. Uh, showing a much more activated state. And this is, as I say, very simplified. It's really more metaphorical than not. It's just to say the brain's doing very different things when people are manic and depressed. Um, no, there's a lot of um, history behind this. This is not a new idea. The, the notion of a connection between creativity and madness goes back to pre-Grecian myths and, and uh, history. And likewise, the old uh, writers, uh, going back to the ancient physicians, this is something they observed, the philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, uh, the relationship between highly elevated mood states in particular. Um, 
And I, I just want to touch on temperament um, because Dr. Ketter will. This is actually taken from my nephew's uh, art class. And I think it's quite wonderful because there are a lot of things that go into creativity other than just creativity itself. I mean, it's one thing to have an idea, it's another thing to act on an idea. And acting on an idea has some aspects of grandiosity and expansiveness and drivenness, but it also there's a resilience and a tendency to persevere. That anybody who's doing anything that's at all different is going to get very criticized. And the question is not whether or not uh, you get criticized, the question is what, once you're criticized, whether you bound back or not. Um, and not to speak highly of depression, because I don't think anyone who's been depressed would, um, but there are certain aspects of depression that lend itself to reflection and introspection and puts into perspective things that might have been generated in a more volatile or fevered manic state. Uh, people tend to get very obsessive and critical when they're depressed, and if they have written something or composed something, when they were feeling expansive, they might then, when they're depressed, get highly critical of it and, it, at the end of the day, make it into a much better object. Um, there's a tendency for many people who have experienced depression to feel that they have increased sensitivity and compassion as a result of that, and th therefore some perhaps increased awareness of the human condition. And a tendency to, for anyone who's been depressed, to have less denial. There's a kind of classic study that shows that people who are depressed actually have a much more accurate view of a depressing world uh, than people who are not depressed, uh, which is depressing in its own right. <laughs> okay, I just want to finish up now by um, talking about a few of the implications. This is. Uh, the question comes up, and very legitimately, of what are the, what are the implications? You know, if if you have these um, illnesses that are, on the one hand, highly destructive and potentially lethal, and on the other hand, bring a highly imaginative quality to some people, the minority of people who have these illnesses, but and therefore add something to society as well. The question is, what happens if you then treat them? And I think that there are, in treating anyone, there are a series of issues that you have. You, you always have an obligation to tell people what the risks of treatment are, what the side effects are of any medication, what the long-term effects are of any medication, um, or, or psychotherapy, for that matter, not just medication. Um, but you also have an obligation to say, what are the risks of no treatment? And as somebody who spent a great deal of my uh, psychotherapy life treating artists and writers, I can tell you that artists and writers tend to focus on the risks of treatment and not on the risks of no treatment. And I think as a result, clinicians have a real obligation to, to emphasize what happens if you don't get treated. And that they're not either or sorts of things. In this day and age, fortunately, we have medications that are, are um, less devastating and um, I'll, I'll get that, to that in a minute. There are certainly risks to treatment. Um, these are drugs. Most of the drugs that are used to treat mood disorders um, act, obviously, by acting on the brain. You can't have it both ways. You can't say that you have a medication that works on the brain that doesn't work on the brain. It does. It works on energy. It works on mood. It works on cognition. Um, the question is always to try and get people to take the minimal amount of any medication the best kind of psychotherapy, and get people involved in their treatment so that they, they can minimize the side effects and, and maximize um, their imaginations. Um, but there are very real risks of treatment, of no treatment, and those include suicide first and foremost and always because these are potentially very lethal disorders. Um, that there are very destructive aspects of having repeated manic episodes and repeated depressive episodes, and I'm sure Dr. Ketter will probably be talking about this. These are toxic conditions. These have a real effect on the brain. It's, it's not, and the, the medications that work well, for example, lithium, actually has, it turns out, has a very neuroprotective, uh, neurogenerative quality. So there, these are things to really keep in mind. Um, again, the illness tends to progress, um, and the effects of medications I'm always struck by artists and writers somehow feeling that 
drugs like alcohol and cocaine are somehow have fewer side effects and fewer long-term adverse effects than um, prescribed medications. Um, this is just a, this is actually a study of a long time ago. I'm, I actually meant to replace it, but it's, it's essentially the same data. The, these, the medications that we have now really do save lives, and since suicide is such a major risk, um, we know there are probably 30, 35 studies now showing a lower risk of suicide in people who have been treated with lithium. And another thing uh, in terms of mitigating factors is that two-thirds of patients, for example, who are on lithium, in fact, report no significant changes in intellectual functioning of any kind. And the two studies that have looked at artists and writers and said, do you feel as productive, more productive, less productive on medication than you did before medication for your mood disorder? Three quarters of them, of the artists and writers, say that they are as productive or more productive on medication. And that's, again, because these are such totally debilitating illnesses. And I just want to end, uh, before introducing Dr. Ketter, by getting back to Robert Lowell. And Robert Lowell was just got treated really on the cusp of when, when lithium was first introduced. And once he was put on lithium, he stopped having his manic episodes. He stopped needing to be in the hospital. And his publisher said about him and his editor, of all our conversations, I remember most vividly, vividly Lowell's words about the new drug lithium carbonate, which had, had such good results and gave him reason to believe he was cured. It's terrible, Bob, to think that all I've suffered and all the suffering I've caused might have been arisen from the lack of a little salt in my brain. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Terence Ketter, who's Professor of Psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine and Chief of the Stanford Bipolar Disorders Clinic. He's one of the world's leading authorities on brain imaging techniques and study of mood disorders, particularly bipolar disorder, as well as a physician scientist who has conducted important research into pharmacological treatments of mood disorders. Dr. Ketter is the editor of the text, Advances in the Treatment of Bipolar Disorders. And he and his colleagues at Stanford have undertaken pioneering studies into the relationship between temperament and creativity. He'll be talking this evening about clinical and neuroimaging studies of creativity. Terry? Thanks, Kay. Thank you, Kay. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and uh, to be able to share some of these findings with you. Um, that's about halfway through it. Yeah, okay, there we are. Okay, so for this, um, what I've tried to do is to try to put this in the language English instead of a lot of jargon. Okay, so I, the, the title is Feelings and Thinking Mechanisms of Creativity in Bipolar Disorder. Okay, so as, as Dr. Jameson illustrated, there appears to be a linkage between bipolar disorder and creativity. And if that is the case, then how does that happen? I got interested in this because I'm running a, a, a clinic and you can't help but notice in your clinic that there are individuals that are highly creative and they have concerns about medications, and uh, perhaps uh, need to share uh, some of those concerns in order to get the best treatment. And uh, the, the clinical samples that I'm describing today all uh, have a level mood. They're between episodes. Uh, about a third of them are not taking medications and about two-thirds were taking medicines and actually in a separate analysis I won't present today it didn't make any difference. And really, I think having a, a level mood is, is, a, is a key aspect of this. So I want to do uh, three things today. I want to uh, show you some data from our group showing that creativity is enhanced in patients with bipolar disorder. These are patients in our clinic. Uh, and I also want to look uh, at some preliminary steps towards figuring out how that works. So what contributes to this? And I'll present some data that suggests that negative 
uh, or changeable feelings. Okay, so emotions have a piece. And also that intuitive and open-minded thinking has a piece. So there's a feelings piece and a thinking piece. And then I'll sh share with you a very little bit of our uh, uh, neuroimaging data that we have that we've applied to, to these sort of, uh, these sort of uh, issues. Okay, so can, can we put the whole talk into six words on one slide? And, and this is it, okay? So the mechanisms of creativity and bipolar disorder, and what I would want to try to convince you after I've shown you that, that it's enhanced in our group, is that negative and changeable feelings have a piece, and intuitive and open-minded thinking has a piece. Okay, so two different aspects. Now, you might think that feelings are inherently related to mood disorder. So that, that perhaps is not quite as novel as the notion that the kind of thought process or the, the, the way people think, the way they do mental operations, which is not as obviously directly related to mood, uh, has a piece in this. Uh, I've done my best to protect you from this sort of stuff, which is jargon. So that's basically the same slide using the kind of jargon that we uh, that we get we uh, in the in the field expose ourselves to, and so that negative feelings ha are termed the by the unfortunate term neuroticism, uh, which is highly pejorative. Uh, you could in, in fact say people who lack, lack this have passion deficit disorder, if you wanted to label a group. Um, so it, 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 it's unfortunate the name some of these things have. Cyclothymia is, is a descriptive term for ch very changeable feelings, a, a, a moody temperament, if you like. Um, over on the other side, uh, the jargon translates a little better, uh, intuition and openness to experience rather than open-mindedness. So uh, what I'll be describing today is uh, some work that's going to be uh, presented at the American Psychiatric Association in San Francisco uh, this spring. And so there's 32 bipolar patients, 42 healthy controls, uh, 21 unipolar patients, and 22 creative controls. So the real comparison is the bipolar and the healthy controls. The uh, unipolar patients are there to see if there's anything special about bipolar versus unipolar. And the creative controls are there as a kind of check on some of the creativity metrics and some of the temperament metrics, okay? And so we, there are a ba uh, battery of tests that we have uh, focused on, and I'm, uh, this is a very selective presentation, just sort of giving you the, the essence of what it is. And so as, as a creativity uh, test, I'll show you something called the Baron Welsh Art Scale, and then for looking at personality and thinking, there's something called the five-factor model of personality that we'll look at. There's another thing called the Myers-Briggs type inventory. This is used very much by occupational psychologists, not so much by psychiatrists. And finally, uh, um, Haga Pakiskal has a temperament scale that is developed by a psychiatrist. So, one of the problems with looking at so-called everyday creativity where you're looking at samples, clinical samples, is that you have to have some kind of a metric of creativity. And there are lots and lots of these metrics. And some of them have a good face validity, but they're very difficult to do. Others may not have the greatest face validity. They don't look so as obviously valid as, as some of the other ones. But uh, this one was developed by Frank Barron and George Welsh and uh, over at uh, the University of California at Berkeley, there was a uh, creativity group that was very interested in developing a wide range of creativity measures, and this is but one of them. So this is just a representative measure. And this one is interesting because um, it was derived empirically from hundreds of line drawings and looking at creative and uncreative groups and just skimming off the 86 that best separated those two groups. Okay, so it's an empirically derived measure. It is a measure that has a, a theoretical basis as well. It wasn't completely random. But uh, the instructions are, decide whether you like or don't like each of the following drawings. Mark each with an L for like and D for dislike. If you can't decide, guess. Don't skip any drawings. 
Try to work as fast as you can. Okay, so this is a forced choice, okay? And buried inside this, I think, is actually an affective task, okay? Because there's like and dislike. And I have seen few metrics in which the people who start, uh, score the highest on the metric are the most pissed off by the test and think it's the least valid. But this is one of them, okay? So th this is an, is an intriguing little test. and. One of the things is that there isn't a whole lot of language uh, uh, besides, the, uh, besides the instructions. This, is, this was developed and then validated, and interestingly, it, perhaps it's not surprising that visual artists and, and such can score very well on this, but uh, creative writers will score well on this. So it, it's, it, it's not confined to the visual realm. Anyway, the way it works out is that uh, you get points for liking complex asymmetric images, and you get points for not liking simple symmetric images. And actually, you can get more points by not liking things than liking things. Okay? So, could it be that if you had access to negative emotion, You'd be able to not like things and then pick on that stuff on the right. Uh, could it be if you were open-minded and sort of intuitive, you could like the stuff on the left and say you like that? And could it be if you had changeable mood, you can flip back and forth between those two and do the test well? Let's see. Well, what else are we, so what are we measuring? And just to give you a little bit of the background here, so these negative feelings, or so-called neuroticism and open-mindedness, these come from something called the five-factor model of personality developed in Baltimore, of all places, National Institute of Aging. Uh, landmark studies there done, some people thinking this is really the benchmark for personality research. Uh, there are five factors. Two of them are of importance to us. Uh, one of them is uh, this so-called neuroticism. And if you have a look, worrying, temperamental, self-pitting, self-conscious, uh, emotional, vulnerable, this, this instrument has a hard edge. Um, and even openness, I mean, it's imaginative, creative, original, prefer variety, curious, and liberal. That sounds, uh, all right, okay. But if you're not open, then you're uncreative, conventional, prefer routine, uncurious, and conservative. Okay, so it, um, it, has, been, it has been criticized as perhaps having too hard of an edge. And the Myers-Briggs type inventory has uh, taken a completely different approach to personality, saying, well, people are different. They're not good or bad, they're different. And so this is where neuroticism and openness has its origin. The Myers-Briggs type inventory doesn't have neuroticism, okay? And um, it, has, it has four factors, basically, and these roughly correspond to the non-neuroticism factors of the five-factor model. And in fact, uh, uh, Costa McRae did this. We, we actually did the correlations in our group, and they were almost identical to those of Costa and McRae. And so there's no, no neuroticism there, so nobody has to be sick with this. And in fact, the people who developed the Myers-Briggs type inventory are very interested in leadership and occupational medicine and don't want anything to do with somebody running a bipolar clinic. Uh, and so what you see there, though, is uh, something called intuition that correlates with openness to experience, okay? And if you look in the creativity literature, uh, the thinking constructs that perhaps are the um, most widely cited as being related to creativity are these two, intuition and openness to experience. Just to give you an idea of how warm and fuzzy the Myers-Briggs is, you can see the in, in, intuitive types on the right there, all, all kinds of things uh, that are, are a little bit like openness to experience, but then the sensing types on the left, rather than being unopened or closed, as in the NEO, the sensing types, they're, they're trying to find something nice to say about everybody, okay? And this may be a little too warm and fuzzy, but I, the sensing type, there, there are values uh, in having people in our society who have these skills. And certainly, um, 
the people who work with the Myers-Briggs see it as an instrument that doesn't pathologize personality, okay? And so it, it's important to have something in that because if you're really trying to step back and look at the creative process in general and get free of this notion of psychopathology, it would be nice to have something and perhaps this cognition approach of Myers-Briggs is worth, worth integrating. So anyways, this is the sample for, that got all of those assessments. And so th you can see there's, there's uh, um, a slight majority of women. We did, not feel, we did not find any creativity difference between men and women uh, the, in, in pretty well everything. And w in the Myers-Briggs, it does fit one cultural stere stereotype. Women are more feeling and men are more thinking but we didn't find any, any other finding with respect to gender, gender of significance. Um, the age of this group, uh, Kay mentioned that, these, uh, that folks who have bipolar disorder have an onset in the late teens and uh, many studies of bipolar disorder, you'll see an average age in uh, mid 30s to 40 with an average duration of about 20 years. Uh, ours is no exception. Education, uh, this, you know, the generalizability of this cohort is a little bit of a problem because we're from suburban uh, San Francisco, sort of Silicon Valley, and so these people all have insurance that Stanford takes, okay? So the generalizability of this to a community mental health clinic is limited. Uh, this population has plenty of education slightly more education in the creative controls. The creative controls have slightly more education because every single one of them is a graduate student in product design, fine arts, or writing at Stanford. Okay, so there's a little bit of a, a bias. You can correct for all these things. And the, down along the bottom is Beck Depression Inventory uh, Scale. And um, in clinical trials, to, if you've got depression, you want to get into a clinical trial, you need about a 20 on this. And if it's less than 10, you're doing pretty okay. And you can see that, uh, in general, these people are not clinically depressed, and none of them were hypomanic at the time. Uh, creative controls, about half of them had a history of either depression or drug or alcohol use, but not bipolar, and half didn't. And basically, their creativity scores in those two groups were very similar. So it's, it's, uh, these are the results. So that funny line drawing test, it's, that's the Baron Welsh total, and then you can look at the dislike scale and the like scale. And what you see there is about a 50% advantage over the healthy controls in the bipolar and creative controls. 50% higher co uh, scores in the total. And most of it's coming out of the dislikes subscale. They're in the middle, okay? And there, it's like 80, 90 percent taller. And even the inter unipolars get in the act on that. Now, the, the unipolar group was able to, they're pretty good at disliking things, but they've actually got a deficit at liking things. They're below. <laughs> All right. yeah, so, you know, it's, uh, that, maybe, that's why that, maybe that's why they didn't make it on the total, OK? And there is some, if, if, you look at, uh, if you look at some of the mechanisms, that, that kind of fits as well. So I was trying to say that negative feelings, changeable feelings, intuitive thinking, open-minded thinking uh, were overrepresented in the bipolar patients. So let's have a look here. So these are the negative feelings. This is the so-called neuroticism. You'll notice that this is, this is a pretty substantial uh, difference, but it, it's dwarfed by this 10 times bigger difference on changeability of emotion, okay? And the reason is that that changeability of emotion is, is a scale made by a psychiatrist going after differences between unipolar and bipolar. And in fact, you, you see this, this difference here. But basically, the mood disorders, n negative emotion lacks any kind of valence with respect to unipolar bipolar. And that's Dr. Kiskel's uh, big problem with that construct. Okay? And by bringing uh, cyclothymia changeability, you get something that distinguishes the bipolar. Does this take it across the goal line on creativity? 
I don't think it does. In fact, I think what, what ends up taking across the goal line are the differences in thought processes. And so if we go over here to thinking, and you'll notice this now has a different scale. Okay, these are smaller differences. They're still significant. They're not as highly significant. And the reason that is that these are things that are not specifically designed for mood disorders, applied to a mood, mood disorders issue. But you can see that uh, it, scores for intuition in the bipolar uh, and the creative controls are elevated significantly. Uh, we like to, just like remember when you're in school, the uh, uh, teacher would give you a star when you did something good, you get, you get a star if you're clinically, uh, statistically significant, okay? So that's what the stars are for. And so we see an increase in intuition, uh, kind of similar between the bipolars and the creative controls, and also an inter increase in open-mindedness, okay? So basically, these constructs, intuition and open-mindedness that have been associated with creativity, are enhanced in the bipolars and the creative controls. And the healthy, and the health, healthy controls, the norms, we looked at normative data, our healthy controls are within a percent or two of the, the population norms. So there's nothing odd about that. And then the, the unipolar group is something just a little bit different and uh, doesn't quite make it. There's a little bit of it there, but doesn't quite make it to statistical significance. So we can build this kind of a model. So what, what we can do to say, okay, creativity's increased, and uh, negative feelings, changeable feelings, intuitive thoughts, open-minded thoughts are increased. Uh, what's that, do those relate to each other? And the answer is yes. So these are correlations, and they, they do something uh, by squaring the correlation coefficient to give you a number that explains the contribution, okay? So you see, uh, with respect to feelings, negative feelings contributed about 15% of that total score of the Baron Welsh, and changeable about 14, so pretty high. Uh, thinking, intuitive thinking and open-mindedness not quite as much, a little bit less. All of those were significant, though. Now, looking at these kind of percentages, if I saw something that, that accounted for like 80% of creativity, one, one item, I'd really wonder what was up, because this is multifaceted. Okay, and I think things that are, things that are, are in the neighborhood 10 to 20% are of clinical interest, uh, it's very interesting. It, we, it, a lot of, a lot of the, the work that we do with medications, if a medication has a 10% advantage over placebo, uh, that is usually enough to get it FDA approved. Okay, so those are the kind of margins that we're working at. So 10%. So so, but if we drill down on this a little bit, we can see something. Okay, um, the negative feelings in changeable mood we're basically working on the dislike subscale, okay? Remember saying that those would, that certainly the negative feelings, you maybe you would be able to dislike things better. And in contrast, which is was kind of enlightening, uh, intuitive thought processes and open-mindedness actually correlated with the like subscale. Now, the like is the junior partner in the whole enterprise, okay? But um, negative feelings and changeable feelings did not correlate with like. And in fact, intuitive feelings and open-minded feeling, uh, thoughts and intuitive thoughts did not correlate with dislike, although uh, intuition got close. So you, you've, got a, you've got a potential mechanism there that in fact the creative advantage we see in the bipolars comes from uh, not, on, not only the mood itself, but perhaps, as, as suggested by the right-hand side of the screen, uh, the way thinking occurs. And just to show you that this, um, this notion uh, about using thought processes is, is not totally irrelevant to, to the enterprise of understanding creativity, we did something called the Adjective Checklist Creative Personality Scale, and there you see open-mindedness really start to shine because it, it really is the poor cousin. It's kind of, it's, it's the least among, amongst the four, but it, it did quite well on that and as uh, did intuition. 
there have been multiple studies showing that in the past. So that's where we're kind of focusing on that. And the feelings didn't really have that much to do with that scale. Now, one of the things is, so suppose we, we know how this works, and there's the thinking brain and the feeling brain. How can we relate these kind of things to what's going on inside the brain? Uh, Kussler's uh, definition of creativity is meaningful, rule-transcendent production. And you can actually uh, parcel out parts of the brain that will give affective meaning to different stimuli or remember things or uh, create associations or actually implement, implement plans. So there's brain areas that can do these kind of things. And just as, as one example, these are some correlations of brain images, and these are correlations with that art scale, okay? And this is brain structure, actually. This is just a picture of the structures of the brain, even. You can do this with functional MRI and say, have them do the Baron Welsh in the scanner and things like this. But this is even at the level of uh, structure. And Kay was mentioning that some of these medications could be neurotrophic. But what we found, basically, that in 25 healthy volunteers who had uh, MRI scans, we did something that they call voxel-based morphometry, where you basically look at the entire brain and look for differences or correlations. And uh, the measure that came out positive was gray matter density. And one of the problems with brain imaging is that we're, we, can, we, we are able to measure things before we fully understand what they mean. Okay? And brain Im a gray matter density is probably one of those measures. But in any case, we got positive correlations in regions associated with feelings and associative thought. Okay, so the feelings could have something to do with uh, those negative feelings or changeable feelings. Associative thought could have something to do with um, intuition, could have something to do uh, with open-mindedness. And then we got negative correlations in regions associated with analytic thought. Okay, more, more kind of operational um, rote thinking. Okay, so th these are some interesting, interesting preliminary data that uh, we're still working on. So in conclusion, we have data from a clinical sample that shows creativity is enhanced in our patients with bipolar disorders to a level similar to that to gra graduate students in creative disciplines. And we've got at least some preliminary evidence of how this happens, and it may be mediated through negative changeable feelings, so having an emotional component, as well as intuitive, open-minded thought processes. And there are emerging data trying to exp exp explore exactly where this lives in the brain. And with this, as well as further clinical studies, hopefully we can better understand how to treat our patients with bipolar disorder. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ketter. Um, I should have said earlier that we're just holding questions till the end. We decided we wanted to have as much time as possible for questions at the end, so we kept our talks uh, relatively short. So after Dr. Weibrow's book, and we'll be answering as best we can anyway. Uh, Dr. Peter Weibrow, as I said earlier, is the director of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior as well as chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA. He was before that chairman of psychiatry at Dartmouth Medical School and, before, and then um, at the University of Pennsylvania. He is an internationally acknowledged scientist who has been fundamental in contributing to our understanding of the role of the thyroid hormone on the brain, especially its critical role not only in the pathophysiology of bipolar disorder, but also in his treatment, particularly in the treatment of people who have very rapid cycling forms of the disorder, which is a particularly terrible form of the disease. Dr. Weibrow is as well a superb and widely published author, most re recently of American Mania, and earlier a wonderful, thoughtful, and beautifully written book called A Mind Apart. It's a remarkable book on the philosophical and clinical and humanistic aspects of depression and mania. And if you don't have it, 
I recommend it. Dr. Weibrow? This gentleman, whose birthday it is today, was a prodigy. He was born of a wealthy family in Hamburg and moved very rapidly to Berlin. He then started to play the piano under the tutelage of his mother about the age of six. The family was very musical and they would have soirees in their house in Berlin. His father was a banker. His grandfather, Moses Mendelssohn, was a famous philosopher in Germany. And by the age of nine, he was giving concerts. By the age of 13, he had written a quartet. At the age of 15, he had orchestrated a full symphony. And of course, then you all know the Midsummer Night's Dream music that he wrote, which is the wedding march, which he did when he was about 17. By the time he was 20 and he went to England, he was a celebrity. He fell in love with England, in fact wrote uh, a fine Scottish symphony on Hebrides and Fingal's Cave and all those pieces that are there associated. And then at 26, he was the head of the Gewandhaus Orchestra in Leipzig. At 34, he founded the Leipzig Conservatory for Music. And at 38, he was dead. So this man is extraordinary. Most of us at the age of 38 are wondering what to do with our lives. So we have to ask ourselves, what was it that drove this man? Why is he so different? Well, a few years ago, now five probably, I met a man in Los Angeles whose name is Michael Tannenbaum. He is something of an entrepreneur himself and a very successful businessman. And he challenged me and the Institute to look at what is the biology of creativity. We really know very little about creativity. Creativity at the moment is at about the same place as memory was in our understanding scientifically 20 years ago. And so he said to me, I want you to study this. I said, well, nobody knows how to begin. He said, well, that's the challenge. I'm going to give you an endowment and you have to figure that out. So uh, fortunately, we have many wonderful neuroscientists at the Institute and at UCLA. And I started off by just asking people to submit ideas that they thought might be relevant to creativity. And we got all sorts of ideas from across the university, ranging from frontotemporal dementia, which is an odd uh, deterioration of the frontal lobes that sometimes reveals artistry in the individual who's suffering, and the use of drugs, uh, schizophrenia, manic depressive illness, all sorts of things came in. And from that, we began to distill what it might be that underlies this extraordinary creativity as one might see it in a man like Mendelssohn. And as you can see from this slide, we came to the conclusion that at the core was emotion, of course, because emotion is the system in the brain that connects us to the, to the world around us. The, it's, you can imagine it as vision. Emotion can go wrong in many different ways, but actually its function every day is to integrate what we have within ourselves and what we perceive in the world and create an opportunity for um, performance based upon those things. But around that, if you think about creativity, what is it that you need? And we came down to the conclusion that first of all, you need some sort of novelty generator, which you see here in the purple. And of course, in order to manipulate ideas of any size or number, you must have memory, a prodigious memory. And then, 
The other thing which is very important we decided as we went through the proposals that we had was what the psychologist calls response inhibition. In other words, you have to break up habit. You know, most of us, if you think about it, are creatures of habit. We drive to work through the same streets. We sit in the same chair. It's quite uncanny. You know, at the Institute, if we have meetings and we have regular meetings, people always come into the, into the room and they sit in the same chair. We're very much creatures of habit. And in order to be creative, one must break that up. So these three elements around the core of emotion seem to us to be important. And so we set forth trying to figure out how we might study that. And we're now in the middle of this series of studies. But on the following through with the colors, you can see that in terms of novelty generation, memory, and cognition, we have set up some studies which start at the basic science level, usually with animal models, and then go through to a human investigation. And we have been collecting 300 very uh, brilliant young children from the Los Angeles area, and we are beginning to study them in terms of what makes them different with the hope that we might be able to associate some of our basic science studies with what we find in the uh, young human being. So I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to talk about all this tonight because there isn't time, but I'm going to talk briefly about the novelty generation, particularly as it pertains to some work we've been doing in songbirds, and then also a little bit about memory and an enhanced memory mouse that has been made. And then I will talk a little bit about the cognitive control side of things and bring that back to the discussion of music, etc. So, songbirds are very interesting because this is the zebra finch for obvious reasons. It has a little zebra coat. And um, these creatures teach each other how to sing. This is actually a pupil with his tutor, usually his father. And they learn the standard song, but the young finches, which are particularly good, manage to extrapolate upon that basic song. And they actually are the ones who get the, the female birds. They're the ones who the ladies flock to. So it's a courtship behavior, among other things. And of course, there is some overlap, in one sense, with what we do. You see, we're all very creative. Let's just think about it. Every time you open your mouth and create a sentence, you have made something novel, because that sentence probably will never be repeated again. And you do this in an interactive way with others, and there is some evidence that, in fact, as you can see from poets and from Serrano and others, uh, that the courtship behavior is embedded in that. The poet always gets the woman, you know. So, and music too. So in fact, there's an interesting association between verbal facility and the ability to actually generate not only the first song, which of course is the first art in music, but also perhaps with music itself. Well, about 20 years ago in England, a family was discovered who for about three generations had had particular difficulty with language. In fact, you couldn't really understand what they said in some of the members of the family. Even though they tried extremely hard, they could not maintain the intonation, which most of us automatically are able to do as we grow. And it was discovered that this family had a particular a gene on chromosome 7, which is now called the FOXP2 gene, because it is actually has got a forked, it's called um, FOX because it's a forked head, and also a um, box gene, which is a particular genetic 
generic form of genetics, which these are, these are actually genes which don't do very much themselves, but they turn on a great deal of other genes in the brain. And it was discovered that this particular gene was damaged in these individuals who could not uh, develop proper language. And this was a fraction of, you can see it, for those of you who are at the front, the little red line that goes across. That was a mutation in this family that completely disrupted the function of the gene. And from there, it was found that, in fact, this gene is extremely old and it is conserved, as the geneticists say, throughout evolution. A mouse, for example, who is, who we diverged from the mice about 70 million years ago, has this same gene, and so do chimpanzees and all the other apes. The interesting thing is that the mouse and the ape have only one mutation different in their FOXP2 gene. That same gene is in the zebra finch as well. Now we, the human species, Homo sapiens, have two mutant differences from the um, great apes and the other primates. And there's some speculation that in fact those mutations have occurred in the last 100 to 200,000 years, which may suggest why it is that we can articulate sounds in a much more precise way so that with that articulation we're able to communicate much more precisely than the songbird can or the um, other primates can. So there may be an interesting correlation here with language with this particular gene. So Stephanie White, who is one of the scientists at the Institute who works in this project, has been able to show that when you actually damage this gene in the finch, you don't actually remove it completely, but you downgrade it so that it doesn't work quite as effectively, the songbird actually doesn't produce the, the, the tune in quite the same way as the father is teaching it. And similarly, you find that when the, the songbird, the young songbird, the, the, the one being taught, is particularly adept, that there is a great advance in the activity of this particular gene. So we're not saying here that, in fact, this gene explains the activity of language or music, but what we are saying is that it relates to a cascade of genes which actually are very important. And of course, all of us are all slightly different. As you can see, everybody's face is the same, but it's also unique, and so is our chemistry. So you can imagine that there would be minor changes that might lead to somebody having a much greater facility. For example, my father, who is a musician, had perfect pitch and he never quite understood why I couldn't play the violin like he did because I do not have perfect pitch. There was a scrambling of our genes and he, he, I did not get what he had. So one must asks then in this particular instance, in this first area of how does novelty get generated, what happens when somebody is speaking or when one, somebody is reading or when somebody is playing or, pl or, or reading music? And in this particular slide, I hope you can see it from the back, these are all individuals who are actually patients of ours at the Institute, and this is work of Susan Buchheimer, one of my other colleagues. And this man, who is a fantastic sight reader of music, has a tumor in his brain where you can see it with the, where the yellow arrow is, is focused. And it's in his parietal region. The way you look at this is if I took off my head, okay, and held it up like this, you're looking at it underneath. So in fact, the, the way you are looking at it is that this side of the head is the left side, and this man is, is, is right-handed. So he has a tumor in the dominant um, hemisphere. And of course, when you go to operate on such a tumor, you want to be sure that you take out only the pieces 
that you must, and you try to preserve the speech areas and other areas that are important. So what Dr. Buchheimer does is she um, does these um, fMRI scans, similar to what you were seeing earlier, which then help us understand exactly where that uh, um, tumor is and what we should be careful of when taking it out. And as you can see in this particular instance, when the individual is, is reading or playing music, there is a much more active area in the parietal visual area of the cortex, which is in that circle that you see on the far right there, your far right, compared to when they are speaking words. So let's look at another person who is a composer. Now this person is in the scanner and is asked to think of a story, compose a story in his, in his mind, and also then to compose a piece of music. He's not playing the piece of music, but he's thinking about the piece of music. So first of all, note where the tumor is. The tumor in this case is in fact very close to what is called broker's area, which is where the production of language occurs. And so we were very concerned that in taking this particular tumor out, we would destroy his speech center. And so these studies were done extensively. And as you can see, again, when he's generating language, there are far few orange and yellow pieces on that particular slide. Just to emphasize that, let's look at the next one. Excuse me, we've gone too far. Let's look at this one. And you can see that, in fact, in that square, that yellow square in the top, of the top there, which is when he is thinking of melodies, there is a whole area of brain which is being used. In fact, what this man is doing is he's using his acoustic part of the cortex as well as the parietal cortex. So his, he is listening, if you will, to himself generating the music without making a sound. So what we can conclude is that composers, Mendelssohn, for example, probably listened to all that music in his head when he was composing. And he was able to do that at a very early age, just as Schumann was, for example, who I will talk about briefly in a minute. So in order to be able to do that, not only do you have this cascade of very unusual generating um, machine, which the, was the novelty generator, but you have to have a prodigious memory. And so we go back to our diagram and let's think about what is working memory in this particular instance. So in order to be able to substantiate this hypothesis, it should be possible, should it not, to be able to improve memory. And in fact, that's exactly what one of our scientists has done. Alcino Silva is a um, molecular biologist and a behaviorist. And what he's been able to do is build something which he calls the mighty mouse. Now this work started from neurofibromatosis. Some of you may know of that illness. Uh, it's a, you individuals have prominent uh, nerve fibers in their body, develop little nodules, and they also have caffeole patches on their skin. But very often, people who have this illness, they have intellectual deficits. And so it was in studying this that, that um, Alcino discovered that, in fact, this, again, this transcription uh, gene, RAS, H. RAS, which you see at the top of the, of the green slide here, was actually something that generated the, um, the ERK, which is the extracellular receptor kinase. And this particular kinase is very important in going to a next stage of the metabolic cascade, which is the synapsin 1, which in turn creates a lot of these vesicles, which are where the communicating packages of neurotransmitters sit in the, in the neuron. And so what we see here is that there is a change in one of the neurons, the 
presynaptic neuron, which becomes much more active. And in becoming much more active, it generates much more signal and much more information that goes across the synaptic cleft. How do we know that this animal is smarter? Well, interestingly enough, in a swim test where you put the little mice in a bowl of water and they can swim around, they can't see the bottom, they find a platform on which they can stand. And then you take the platform away and you put them in again, and the mighty mouse swims immediately over to where the platform was and starts looking for it. These, this, the regular mouse and the mighty mouse have had the same amount of number of trials and it's, it's obvious that the mighty mouse learns much faster in these circumstances. The regular mouse can be trained, but he needs much more in the way of training, probably three times as many tests before he gets it right. So here's another example of how various changes in genetics can probably enhance memory. So we can enhance the novelty seeker, a novelty generator, we can enhance the, the memory, and we begin to think that this is perhaps some of the elements that we have to see in creativity. Now, let's talk about this man, who was, as Kay said, a contemporary of Mendelssohn. He was actually born a year later, lived a little longer. Here he is with his love of his life, Clara Schumann, who had actually was the daughter of his piano teacher. And there's a, some of you may know that story of how they, their great love affair was, um, um, was actually frustrated by the father, uh, Weick, who was the fellow who was training um, Clara to be one of the preeminent female pianists of her time and also was teaching Schumann, but he didn't like Schumann too much, who'd been a bit of a wild fellow when he was younger. But Schumann actually started to compose music when he was seven, very similar to Mendelssohn, but he also wrote. His father was a publisher and a writer, and by the time that Schumann was 16, he'd written a novel. He started, in fact, um, a, liter a book of literary criticism, a magazine of literary criticism and of music criticism, which um, you can still buy today. He was, in fact, another prodigy. And this man was, as I said, frustrated, in the interest of time, I won't go into the many details, frustrated in his courtship of Clara, but eventually he was able to marry her. And then, that was about 1839, and the year later, he wrote something like 138 songs. Some uh, were in uh, uh, adoration of his wife, but in general, they were wonderful songs. And uh, this was then called uh, the Lydia, the year of the song. And in fact, as you saw this slide earlier, this is what has generated that. He, in fact, had had a hypomanic episode. In fact, his roustabout behavior when he was younger, which so upset his piano teacher, because uh, Clara was nine years younger than he was, and uh, uh, the, the father did not think that having this fellow tramp around with his young teenage daughter was a good idea. But when they finally did get married, he was in his late 20s and uh, Clara had just turned 21. You can see that he went into a hypomanic episode. He'd had similar episodes, or they were not so severe when he was younger and when he was reading law, which he didn't like, and turned to music. And as Kay also said, he ended uh, with a severe depression, which was untreated, and basically he starved himself to death. But the important point here is that, in fact, we are now back to the third piece of our cycle, which is the response inhibition. And as you were seeing earlier in what Kay was talking about and Terry was talking about, the interesting thing about severe illness, and it is not just mental illness, but mental illness is perhaps the one that, that particularly engages us, is that 
it generates a whole new vision of the world. In fact, it breaks up old habits. So in fact, what you see is that the element here of cognitive control is lost because of the illness, which then gives insights which without the illness the individual would not have. And that's particularly true of bipolar illness, but it also occurs in other disturbances as well. So in this case, Schumann's hypomania, which led to his extraordinary creativity, was a contributing factor, but it wouldn't have been the only thing which have generated his creativity. As Kay said at the very beginning, mental illness is not equivalent with creativity. The individual has to have many other things, but, but nonetheless, the mental illness can sometimes change the nature of the creativity. And that's an example here for, for, in, in the case of Van Gogh, who we also touched upon earlier. Now this man is extraordinarily fascinating because during his lifetime he only sold one picture. All the others were kept and were in fact curated by his, um, his sister-in-law, Joanna, who, uh, because his brother died only six months after he did, and uh, probably of syphilis, but um, in this particular instance, we also have some 800 letters which were written by Vincent. And you put the two together and you have an excellent uh, ability to actually investigate his life, his artistry, and his thinking at the same time. You'll notice that he's smoking a pipe here. One of the things that Van Gogh also recognized, in addition to his ability to change his behavior under the stress of his illness was that he could change his moods by using tobacco and also by using alcohol. Now in those days ab absinthe was a particularly favorite uh, drink because it has in it herbs which will give you a heightened perception and so many of the artists in that time drank this stuff and you can see that he spent a lot of time in Arles uh, towards the end of his life uh, when he was uh, trying to court Gauguin to come down and be with him. And as you can see from this life chart, which is made up from his letters and so on, uh, most of his productivity, most of Vincent's productivity was in the last few years of his life. The last three years is what we associate. Before that, there was a whole different oeuvre. But in fact, uh, by the time he got down to Arles, and he was in a mixed state of uh, sort of irritability and uh, mania and hypomania. And if you, read his, if you read his letters of that summer, he's busily talking about how he wants to create a whole new school that Gauguin and he will put together in, in the South. What the other most important thing here, ap apropos of our third uh, element of this cycle, is that you see how his, his creativity changes with the illness. Now he was a very solid painter by this time. He had been training himself for many years and he was a great draftsman. And in the spring he painted this particular picture in the year um, before he, two years before he died. And you can see, those of you who are at the front, that this is a complicated picture. It draws your eye into the middle, but in fact there's very little to define the picture other than some construct which you can't really tell. But when you look, if you x-ray this picture, you see that he planned it very carefully and he's got the center organized very carefully with this grid, which was a commonplace thing that people would do in those days. So he, this picture is very planned. And he did the same after he got into the mental hospital. This is after he's cut off the lobe of his ear and he's feeling better. And you can see this is again a planned picture. But look what happens in the fall. And in fact, many of the pictures that you see of Vincent van Gogh in the museums, if you get close to them, you will see that it's layered, the paint is layered one on top of the other. And in fact, he was painting by this time of, uh, of his life more fluently, but particularly during his hypomanic episodes, it seems as if he just painted 
directly onto the canvas. He didn't plan anything. In fact, he was painting several canvases at once, and there are descriptions of him with the paint oozing down his arms in his hypomanic state. So you see again this interesting shift in the nature of his art based upon the um, expression of his illness. So here we come once again then back to the cycle and if you think of the way in which we need novel ideas, we need working memory and we need this disruption of cognitive control which actually was something that uh, Dr. Ketter was also referencing in terms of his studies. So you might ask, well, what happened to Paul Mendelssohn, who actually was pretty healthy? He had a healthy childhood. He grew up most of his life. There wasn't much evidence of mental illness. But then towards the end of his life, his sister, Fanny, to whom he was extraordinarily attached, and in fact, she was a brilliant pianist and, and wrote some uh, music of her own, and the family very often thought that she was the person who was the musician, but in fact, because she was a woman in those days, that was out of the question. But after she died, um, it was only a year or so later that in, in his depression, although he wrote still some fine music, that he too died, and one has to ask whether in fact that wasn't something that disrupted his, his creativity, but also led to his death in the way that we have been discussing it with manic depressive disease. He would have had a unipolar illness uh, following the grief of his, the death of his sister. So on this occasion of his birthday, let's remember him and let's also remember the complexity of these creative processes. Thank you. If any of you all have questions, um, just ask. Yes. And those of us in DBSA, for those of you who um, do devote your careers to research in the area of bipolar disorder, not only for the benefits we, see, we receive in the area of treatment, but for programs like this to help um, to people to learn, maybe perhaps people who have only heard uh, bipolar disorder referred to when someone with bipolar disorder commits a crime. It's, uh, I think it's just a very positive thing in many respects that you are putting on a performance, I mean, excuse me, performing a program like this tonight. So thank you all very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. I have a question about the phrase flight of ideas that I see in a lot of the literature when I'm reading about manic depressive slash bipolar illness. And in many cases, it's depicted as a negative in the literature. And from what I'm hearing tonight, I can see a lot of positives connected to that, in particular to this last idea of um, the generation of non-habit forming thinking. So I just would love to hear what you all think about that phrase, the flight of ideas. Well, I think um, in, in general, actually, when you read in the historic literature, the psychiatric literature, flight of ideas really doesn't have a, either positive or negative associated with it. It's, it's a descriptive term that really is talking about a kind of a leapfrogging effect of going from one concept to another concept to another, sort of tangentially related, usually generated during a what's known as classic mania or euphoric mania, um, and the, after the mood state is generally up. Um, I think that one of the things that's consistent in the creativity literature is that, in fact, you see that kind of flight of ideas. If you, if you take the kind of test of creativity, a standard measure of creativity is a word association test. And so if you ask people to associate to the word tulip, and you can measure the, 
in say two minutes, you give them two minutes to do it, you can measure the number of responses and you can measure the number of original responses by national norms. Uh, a form of, kind of a small form of flight of ideas is exactly that kind of leapfrogging off into ideas. And that is certainly related to both creative thought and uh, to people who are mildly manic, to people who have, if you put people in a situation and you elevate their mood artificially by music, you get an increased number of word associations. But I'd be curious to know what you all think. No, I, I would agree with that. I think, I think it is, it, it breaks up the habits. So when your mind is moving very rapidly, especially in hypomania, there's no doubt um, that, um, as Kay has written about very beautifully, that there is a whole new expansion of the world, which is real, which is very real. And that's why many hypomanic people, especially if, the, if they're, they have what's called bipolar two and their hypomania is somewhat sustained and they don't move into the psychotic disruption of severe mania, they actually become um, very attractive to other people. They, they, they are seen as people who have vision, who have some sort of clairvoyance which the rest of us don't have. So I think it's, it's very much, a, um, uh, in that sense, a, the ability to break up the usual cognitive uh, habits which um, contain us. So just to add to some of the cautions that Kay raises, though, um, what you can see in hypomania is, as Peter described, um, a mild increase in, in rate of thinking could be a positive thing, could be engaging, could be charismatic, but left untreated, about two-thirds, with no additional inter intervention, two-thirds of people with bipolar one disorder who are hypomanic within a month will become mania, manic. And it, it literally is too much of a good thing. And it, 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 it gets to a rate which is uninterpretable, not only to the individual but to others, and the thinking is no longer a benefit. And so there, there are a lot of, in, in medicine, there are a lot of instances of a little bit being helpful and a lot not so helpful. If you get a single gene for sickle cell, you have resistance to malaria. If you've got two, you get a life-threatening illness. And so a, a little bit of mood elevation may have advantages. Uh, a lot has definite disadvantages. And there is something, at least for folks with bipolar one disorder, that is, is unstable about being just a little bit elevated. It, it needs to go one way or the other, generally, if, if that happens. So we, we have to take all of these potential silver linings that, that uh, Kay, Kay has mentioned with, with a grain of salt, if you like. Uh, <laughs> that, that any of these things, if they get unleashed, and they can get unleashed in some forms of the illness, particularly bipolar one disorder. If these things get loose, uh, they are going to wreak havoc on one's life. Yes, up there at the back. Yeah. yeah. Secondly, if you could address um, sort of the implications of that on education. Oh, sorry. Was, was that not, could you not hear me? Just in case they're recording it, can you repeat the question? Certainly. Um, uh, as a special education teacher, I'm really conscious of these things, but I feel relatively uninformed, probably in this crowd. Um, wondered if you could speak to the uh, level of undiagnosed cases of, of bipolar disorder, uh, manic depression among particularly the youth and any implications that that would have on education or any, any thoughts in that, in that regard. My first fellow was Kiki Chang and his first project was to look at the kids of the patients in our clinic and do structured interviews on them and half of them had something or other. And the most common thing was a disruptive behavioral disorder like attention deficit disorder, occupation, uh, oppositional de defiant disorder, or conduct disorder. And uh, the genetics that Kay was talking about, they're very robust. We may see something called age-dependent presentations where the prodrome of 
of a bipolar illness in the offspring of somebody with bipolar may present in a prepubertal child as a disruptive behavioral disorder. It may also present with depression. Uh, Kay was talking about age of onset. Uh, Barbara Geller showed that if you've got a prepubertal -pre kid who gets depressed, even if they don't have a bipolar parent, half of them in 10 years have a bipolar diagnosis. Young adults who get hospitalized, 18 to 25, who get hospitalized for depression, 40% of them in 10 years will have bipolar diagnosis. So the age of onset that Kay was talking about is an important one. And so a lot of the undiagnosed pediatric bipolar disorder may be because the presentations are, are unusual, these disruptive behavioral disorders perhaps. And one of the most important things is that if an individual has a bipolar parent and has that kind of problem, they not just go to a pediatrician who writes a Ritalin script right away because this in fact can destabilize mood or if they're de depressed go to a pediatrician who thankfully will hesitate a little bit these days now with antidepressants but that the that offspring of people with bipolar disorder who have, who have these kind of presentations need a careful evaluation and, and uh, a lot of caution before giving any medicine. Yes, Hello. I think, you know, one of the, that, just to emphasize that, the problem is that they don't usually present with mania. They present with depression. And so the, I think uh, the, when I, a few years ago, I um, conducted a study for the National um, Depressive and Manic Depressive Association, as it was called then, and uh, the results were quite startling. Um, some people, it took up, to, I think it was about 20 or 30 percent of people they went 10 years before the right diagnosis was made and might have met six or seven doctors before the diagnosis was actually confirmed. Hello. Um, I, I have a question, uh, just a housekeeping one. If you could tell us at the end of your speech whether or not we can get copies of the things that you put up uh, by going to your websites, we'd like to know that. But. Um, I am more interested in um, uh, a person who is, may get depressed once in a while, but who is basically okay, uh, normal, but uh, the ingestion of drugs, particularly nodos and um, uh, drugs that are taken to uh, help people feel better and, and feel more positive when they're trying to lose weight. Um, the effect of those drugs on the brain, A, what happens, because I did take notice when I was in school and it was like my brain was on fire and I was so productive and I was working until I crash and burn. But what happens in the brain and does it have a permanent effect? Um, I, th I think it'd be safe to say nobody knows whether it has a really permanent effect because it'd be hard to sort out what, what's, what's going on. I think it's also safe to say that drugs like no, I, mean, I haven't even heard no dose in quite a while, but uh, uh, these drugs are, n are not great. I mean, most, I think w where you really see a lot of complications with bipolar illness in particular, or mood disorders, uh, is that there's a comorbidity. In other words, 60% of people who have bipolar illness, for example, have a history of alcohol and or drug abuse. Uh, and usually the mood disorder comes first and uh, then the drug, drug abuse comes later. These drugs are just, can be really dangerous, not only to precipitating an acute episode of mania or depression, but in making worse the course of the illness and the nature of the symptoms. So the people, uh, when Dr. Weibrow was describing sort of a mixed state where you've got elements, symptoms of both depression and mania, that is far and away the most dangerous state in bipolar illness, for example, in terms of suicide and, and risk and impulsiveness and so forth. Those can really be easily set off by all sorts of medications and uh, prescribed medications and uh, over-the-counter medications. So it's potentially really dangerous. All, most of these drugs also, uh, particularly no-dose by definition, have an, a profound effect on sleep. And once you start, the biology of sleep in depression and in bipolar illness is particularly, I mean, it's, it's like paramount, it's central to the nature of the illness. So once you start mucking about with sleep, you're really playing with fire too. But I don't know if you in all fact, sleep and, sleep and you know, when students take 
no-dos and other things, you know, to keep awake. Uh, that's actually almost a diagnostic uh, probe for people who have bipolar illness. I remember when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, we did a study on what time did the average undergraduate go to sleep? What time do you think it was? 2.30 in the morning, 2.32 to be precise. But the fact is that, 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 um, that that type of sleep deprivation coupled with caffeine, no dose, any uh, um, uh, al alcohol and any other aminergic uh, uh, stimulant drug will uh, drive you into mania if you happen to have the predisposing family history. And some, some people don't even need the no dose. Uh, Dr. Dement, one of our, our very, very esteemed lecturers in, in sleep, mentioned to uh, the stand, one of his classes that if they had if individuals had sleep deprivation, they could get psychotic, and one of those people got to meet me with no no-dose, just the sleep deprivation. And, and one of the roots to psychotic mania is the, the sleep deprivation accelerating the disease. Um, the episodes can cause brain damage, okay? If you've had one depression in your life, your, your risk of another is 50%. 2, 70 percent, 3, 90 percent. There's something going on. So about your question, like could the drugs cause something irreversible? Well, that ir they could, and that irreversible thing could be an episode. Hi. May I uh, ask Dr. Kittle, in your presentation of that test, uh, something breaks test, of the like and dislike, uh, of, the, of the diagrams, uh, one side, the creative Aaron Welsh side. art scale. Yeah. Okay, whatever. And I was just a little bit uh, dismayed at how simplistic the definition of creativity is, right? On one side, you see squares or maybe circles and, and, and exact lines. Uh, well, Plato wouldn't like that, right? He advocated the circle. And if you go into Zen, uh, the simpler, the better, or even uh, Noguchi or uh, Judd, uh, the whole modern 20th century art attest to the violation of that. And how could that continue on? The, meaning, just define those people who di dislike those simple, simple geometric figures are more creative and vice versa. Uh, I am just supported. at that. I dislike that, <laughs> let, let me put it that way. <laughs> you aren't the only person who, who doesn't like that test. I mean, when we, we did a whole bat battery, including the Torrance tests of creative thinking, where people draw imaginative drawings and these things. And these all had sort of correlations with the more cognitive constructs. But the one that drilled down on the affective side was this annoying test. It gets to people. And uh, there are people who try to solve the test or guess the test. Any study of non-eminent creativity is going to have some trouble with the measure. Okay, and so we, we, we've studied four or five different measures. The, the alternative is the kind of thing that Kay's talking about where you have an absolutely rock solid measure of creativity, okay? There's no doubt about somebody like Mendelssohn. But then you don't have control over other things like getting a research quality diagnosis, knowing about medicines, knowing about uh, the, the way their thought processes worked. Um, this is not, using, using, the, using the Baron Walsh, that was the one that popped up separating the groups for affect. Um, I am, I'm just as skeptical as that, of that test. That test is, is as creativity tests go though, it, it, has, uh, it has performed as well as other tests that have much better face validity than it. Uh, so uh, what you presented today was looking at the correlates of pathology and creativity and I, I'm curious what the research shows about the uh, converse which is creativity and wellness and thinking about it in two terms one is to what extent does artistic activity maybe serve as a coping mechanism to control this and then the flip side is I'm fascinated that there are just some fantastically productive artists that are just so darn normal. I mean, you, you think about the, 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 the music of Haydn and, and, you know, and how Haydn treated his musicians and his lifelong steady growth and creativity. Uh, it's a very different story than Mozart, for instance. 
Okay, well, I think, I think uh, a couple things. First of all, again, the argument would not be that anyone who's creative has a mood disorder. I, I, I mean, that's clearly not the case. I, I wouldn't, no one that I know who's studying this would begin to say something like that. It is rather that there is a way disproportionate rate of, of that. Um, and I think it's just important to keep that in mind. Uh, there are a lot of people who have addressed the question that you ask, is there something about doing art, as it were, that is uh, binding that is helpful that that keeps people together in a way that they would not otherwise be and many many artists and writers have addressed that Anthony Storr the um, late English psychiatrist and uh, psychoanalyst talked a lot about that uh, aspect in his his book on uh, uh, the psychodynamics of creativity but Robert Lowell Virginia Woolf I mean it, you name it individual artists have said if I didn't have my art I would be even madder than I am. Uh, that it it binds, it contains. Um, Tennyson wrote about it beautifully. I mean, many many people have written about that. But, but I, I think um, you know one of the things we have to keep in mind, as Kay has said repeatedly, is that um, uh, creativity is not just the province of the artist. It, we're all creative. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, every time you make a sentence, you're being creative. And I think that we have tended to narrow the definition of creativity to people like Mendelssohn, who are obviously several standard deviations from, from, the, from the mean. And uh, if we're ever going to understand what it is that creates this potential deviation, we have to begin looking at people who are closer to the mean, which is basically what we're trying to do in the Tannenbaum uh, program, and, and to dissect it out. And because the disruption, as I was trying to show on the series of slides that I put up, the disruption of the uh, habit is really, you can get there from many different routes. And so it could be that in fact, solitude will allow you to disrupt habit just by just by, in fact, when I write myself, I've discovered that um, I need, if I want to go to sleep, I let myself go to sleep, and then I will uh, wake up, and a few uh, minutes later, I might have the solution to the paragraph that I couldn't write before I went to sleep. So, in fact, I think creativity is, is, a, is, is something that is within all of us, and we probably will learn more about it by coming closer to the norm than we will by trying to study only people who are extraordinarily gifted, such as Mendelssohn and so on. Final word is that, of course, it's not just in the arts, as, 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 as Kay has pointed out. Um, scientists are creative. Uh, uh, even administrators are creative sometimes. It's, uh, <laughs> you have to say that. <laughs> even people at the Library of Congress are creative. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and I think we've just seen how creative accountants can become as well. Um, just just to, to echo this, this idea that Peter talked about, that there being many pathways to creativity, and there are many creativity instruments, okay? And the kind of thing that Baron Welsh uh, measures is not the kind of creativity you'd find in a Zen master. It's the kind of creativity you'd find in an irritable person who was in a garret, you know? Uh, the, the creative personality scale is more like that. Some of the things with the Myers-Briggs are like that. Um, the Myers-Briggs type inventory and, and intuition, it, it's trying to bring it into business. And uh, basically, uh, their, their book, Developing Leadership, it's in the business school library at Stanford. So, I mean, it, in the whole Bay Area, there there a lot of a lot of notions about collegial creativity, uh, um, the, the class that we hold in creativity. Each year we, we have 12 students and uh, four are from the arts and four from uh, psychology and four from neuroscience. The idea of bringing disparate groups of people together for a creative collegial process. So this is, this is a lot bigger than one little figure test or, or pathology. This is something that in fact can be one of the engines of our economy even if we find ways to generalize it into healthy human activity. So your point is very well taken. Um, um, yes, the, the term seasonality was on the screen. 
Uh, is this distinct from seasonal affective uh, disorder? Does either of these play a role in uh, either diagno diagnosing uh, illnesses or sparking them? Would you address this, please? Sure. Uh, seasonality is certainly related to seasonal affective disorder. Seasonal affective disorder uh, refers to generally depression, uh, not always. Uh, people often having a fall depression and then lightening up or becoming hypomanic in the spring, although there are all sorts of variations on that particular theme. And it is a particular diagnostic um, category in a, way, in a way developed mainly by Dr. Norman Rosenthal and his colleagues at the National Institute of Mental Health. But it's really based on the fact that we've known for, we are basically mammals first and foremost, and uh, mammals are enormously responsive to light. And we know that moods and energy are tremendously beholden to light. And so if you look at patterns of everything, of uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Weibrock could talk in, in great detail about particularly, for example, thyroid, cholesterol, serotonin, almost anything that goes on that's important in the brain and the body is seasonal, has a seasonal pattern to it. We know that hospitalization rates for mania are very seasonally dri driven in the summer and the late fall. Suicide, there are over 100 studies of suicide showing a tremendous peaking, spiking of suicide in the late spring and early summer months. I mean, so uh, we know treatment rates, for example, for electroshock therapy, which is an index of actually severity of depression, we know that there are very strong seasonal peaks in that for hospitalizations for depression. So these are, in fact, yes, very seasonal. Yeah, I once wrote a book about it, actually, called Hi The Hibernation Response. And Kay's absolutely right. This was when I was living in northern New, Eng northern New England and teaching at Dartmouth. And we, we uh, everybody, uh, everybody there gets completely miserable in the winter. And uh, yes, that's right. They call it the, they call it the cabin blues or something. And but anyway, we studied normal people uh, over a seasonal variation, a whole year. And the interesting thing was that peop normal people sleep longer in the winter when you're in uh, in the uh, in the north, and they gain weight. So, you know, one thing out of that is if you ever want to start losing weight, don't try in November. Try in March because you'll have a much better success and you'll think you're really doing very well. <laughs> the, 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 the other thing is that uh, um, reproduction, even in human beings, is still seasonal. And if you, again, go to, I took the trouble of going and looking at the births that were uh, at the Mary Hitchcock Hospital in, uh, in Hanover, and in fact, the conception is greatest in the fall, which is exactly the same as the deer herd, which I always thought was rather interesting. And it's all driven by testosterone, basically, which is then in turn driven by the light. But I've always been grateful that we don't grow antlers like the, uh, like the deer, because if we did, you know, you can just imagine what traveling in the fall would be like on the airplanes. <laughs> But so, no, there's, human beings are mammals, and we definitely have seasonal variation, as, as Kay was saying. Uh, maybe two more questions. Um, what is I have the... a question over here. Um, all right. I have a, a friend who is in a nursing home. Um, she's a former beauty queen and a newspaper columnist. She now has a rare form of Parkinson's disease, avipuncular something or other, which is caused by the lithium she has taken over her lifetime for bipolar disorder. And um, is there any word of solace you can offer someone like her? She, she said, why couldn't they just medicate me and keep me sedated during my bipolar periods so that I would live through them to see another day and I wouldn't have to go on lithium and have this terrible disease? She has a Stephen Hawking situation where she can type with one finger and that's it. She can't talk, she can't walk, nothing. What, what words would you offer somebody like her? Is this going to improve into the future? She's 63. Well, I, I, I mean, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say that, first of all, you can't be sure that the lithium caused her Parkinson's disease. You can look at Merck the, the Manual fact, and the fact it is, says it. The fact is that occasionally you will get basal ganglia um, uh, disruption when 
the person has been exposed to very high levels of lithium because they did not, you know, they were not monitored properly. But that's a that's very rare. I've, I'm sure Dr. Ketter is the same. I've, you know, and and, and K2. I, I've uh, I had the first IND in America in 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 northern New England to to actually use lithium back in the early 70s and actually it's an extraordinarily safe drug and although you may see occasional things like this it's highly possible that they are running in parallel the interesting thing about lithium is on the other side of the coin it actually is neuroprotective and the, one of the interesting things is you rarely see anybody with Alzheimer's disease who's been taking lithium so it's uh, I, I think that story needs to be looked into very carefully. In terms of the individual and the tragedy that she faces, uh, then there are various things that could be done, but I'm not sure that one should blame lithium and then generalize it. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, because one of the things about lithium, one of the advantages of lithium is it's been used for more than 55 years in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of patients. So we have more than any drug in psychiatry, really, more data on what are the adverse long-term effects. And there's next to no literature on that suggesting that that's a problem. And, and the, uh, what Peter was suggesting is that there have been recent studies that we know that before lithium existed, that people who had bipolar illness had increased rates of all the dementias, um, Alzheimer's and, and other dementias. And if you look at uh, cohorts of uh, populations of people who have bipolar illness who have been treated with lithium, that dementia rate goes down to the population rate, if not below. So it's a, it's a very complicated thing. And, and it's like kidney disease. That very often there may be a, uh, something else that's, that's going along with it. There's so many millions of people have taken lithium that you know, there are very, very few case reports of what you're describing. It, it doesn't take away from the personal tragedy, but it's just not something that is thought of as an adverse effect of lithium. Okay. Certainly there are, there are antipsychotics that have a, a huge track record for this kind of problem. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that was thought to be so desirable about lithium was that this would be so much less common, these neurological problems with lithium as compared to the antipsychotics. That actually tracks to the question I was wanting to ask, which is, um, I know that in addition to lithium, there are other drugs that are being marketed now for bipolar disorder, namely lamotrigine. And I'm wondering what, if there is a consensus among you, what the preferred uh, pharmaceutical approach would be in conjunction with psychotherapy as a way of managing bipolar illness, but not quashing the creative side of it more than is necessary, and also uh, whether there are sort of alternative medicine approaches like meditation um, or uh, Eastern European approaches that are, sorry, East, uh, uh, Eastern Asian approaches that are being looked at in addition to just uh, psychotherapy with more traditional meds. I think if you look at the gold standard of across hundreds and hundreds of studies of, of medications, medications with psychotherapy, psychotherapy alone, that there would be, a, I, at least my reading of it, would be that there would be a very strong consensus that in an ideal world, insurance companies um, being reasonable agents, um, doctors being good doctors, psychotherapists being good th psychotherapists, that you would have a combination, particularly early on in the illness when someone's young, of psychotherapy and medication. And I think the gold standard in bipolar illness uh, remains lithium. That that is, if you look at the scientific evidence for treatment, that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of other drugs out there that are available. Not everybody responds to lithium. Not everybody wants to take lithium. But if you actually look at the gold standard for treatment, it, I think it still would be lithium. Uh, in terms of alternatives, I mean, we know that there are certain, certainly foods and uh, everything from, you know, I, I think of this kind of the Kodiak bear diet, which is eating salmon and, and eating lots of blueberries, lots of exercise. I mean, all these things, you know, can't help but, but help. Uh, meditation is, is good up to a point, as long as you're doing it the right, right time of day. When I was, had a practice in Los Angeles, a lot of people meditated. Uh, 
and it was very helpful to a lot of people as long as they weren't doing it in the middle of the night because one of the things that happens is that they get sleep deprived and then they would get worse, uh, get hypomanic and, and their illness would get worse. So it's like everything, I think it's using common sense and science. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. When at the University of Pennsylvania, we ran a clinic for people who had the most malignant form of the illness, that is rapid cycling disease. And I was told at the beginning that I, would, should, I was a fool to do this because they would constantly be plaguing me, these poor persons, and they would constantly be in the hospital. Turned out not to be true. And one of the secrets to that is what Kay was talking about and what I call essentially mental hygiene. In fact, if you begin to regulate your life in a way that, in, and as people, as people learn about their illness, you know, the, uh, the best person to take care of oneself is oneself, after all. As one learns about one's illness and one learns what are the triggers, staying up too late, taking too much caffeine, taking any caffeine at all in the case of this partic these particular persons, um, making sure you don't take uh, Sudafed when you get a cold. These are the sorts of things that once you begin to understand them, that they can bring things into order. And there's, there's absolutely no doubt that exercise, meditation, certain diets, all these things, if they're put together in a, in a common sense way, as, as uh, Kay was saying, can be an adjunct to the use of wise counsel and uh, medication. And I too would start with lithium, although in some instances, it's particularly helpful for people who have the classic form, which is severe mania followed by depression, then a free interval. But persons who have bipolar too and have other more complex mixed states, sometimes the, the more recently invented uh, antipsychotics can be helpful. Um, I'm sure Dr. Ketterin uh, is more au courant with the latest on that than I. But I think that it's, it's a thoughtful approach which includes the participation of the person who suffers and the person who has the medical knowledge and everybody around them, the family and so on and so forth, which keeps these illnesses stable. So You have the wisdom though, don't you? I do this all day, every day, yeah. and have a book coming out this summer, ah. Clinical Manual of Bipolar Disorders, American Psychiatric Publishing. Set you up very well. Yeah, it is we great to you. Right. Yes. Um, and in this, actually, it does an analysis of, there's this movement called evidence-based medicine that everything we do ought to be based on knowledge from randomized controlled trials, and every FDA-approved treatment beats placebo by at least 10 percent. That's good news. Bad news is that it's by at most about 30 percent. And so you can calculate something called number needed to treat, which ends up, it's the number of people you have to treat to get one additional good outcome. And for most of our interventions, it is in single digits, okay? It, at least a 10 percent benefit. Um, Problem is that often it's four or five, and maybe that's why patients need four or five interventions. And the kind of interventions you're talking about, the, the randomized controlled trials of adjunctive psychotherapies, the effect sizes were similar to the drugs. This is one of the best kept secrets in bipolar, they, that they work as well as the drugs. Um, but this, they don't work without the drugs. It's all a combination. So, yeah, so this is, this is, I said adjunctive, okay? Yeah, right, so it, it, if you try it without the drugs, it, it seems like the drugs are in some way the foundation. But the Systematic Treatment Enhancement Program, largest study the NIH did on the treatment of bipolar disorder, had two depression studies. One was adding antidepressants to a mood stabilizer and there was no additional benefit. The other was adding intensive psychotherapies to a mood stabilizer and it worked with a number needed to treat that was signal di single digits. So all of the things you've been talking about, lifestyle measures, there's, that it's probably got an effect size similar to that of adjunctive psychotherapy, which has a, an effect size similar to the first medicine and actually if you add a second medicine, it looks like that has a similar sort of addition. So it, the, what's, necessary these days is to craft the, the treatment that best fits the patient. And what you want to have is you want to have stable mood without a bunch of side effects, including affective blunting that could undermine creativity. And whatever it is that takes to do that, 
that's going to be the best patient. The starting point, traditionally it's been lithium. We may see that vary with time, but certainly tradition uh, dictates that lithium is, is the gold standard. Thank you all very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.